believe in them. Okay, you are not asking them to show me some kind of genetic testing done and a certificate to prove that genetically you're linked and so on. You know, you take their testimony. Okay, and you have no reason to doubt their testimony. So in your life, if you are going to be consistent, you need to say, when it comes to the existence of a creator, do I need that, that level of skepticism to accept that the creator exists? Why do I not have that level of skepticism for my mom and dad too? Yeah? <laughs> can I quickly answer that yeah, too? Sure, yeah. Very quickly. Um, can, you, can you just answer this on, on my behalf? So it doesn't get recorded? Yeah. Um, when it comes to the creator, the existence of a creator, we actually have a binary option. It's simple and it's easy to, to, to investigate and come to a conclusion. Existence of the creator means the creator either exists or doesn't exist. You only have the two options. Yeah. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. Either the creator exists or the creator doesn't exist. So, what was it about? Uh, actually, they're going for a meal, so they just outside the gate. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll join them in a later maybe, inshallah. Okay. So, if the creator doesn't exist, if you take that option, what should we expect? No originator of this universe, no maker of this universe, no creator of this universe, no beginner of this universe, that actually there should be nothing. We should yeah, expect nothing. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, I yeah, we should expect nothing. The fact that we expect, we see something, we have a problem. This universe needs an explanation. Either the universe has always been there, or it hasn't been always been there. If it hasn't always been there, you need, it needs an explanation. What is your position? The universe has always been there? Or it hasn't been always been there? Well, um, we just don't really know, do we? Right. Yeah. Possibilities, again. Two options. If it was always there, then I can talk about, in a second, the implications of that. If it wasn't always there, it could not have brought itself into existence while it wasn't there. Yeah. Nothingness couldn't have brought into existence while nothingness itself doesn't have anything. No energy, no power, no will, no consciousness. So the universe could not have been, if it was at one point nothing, brought about by nothingness. It has to be brought by something that is conscious, something that is possessor of volition or will, and energy or power. Then that brings to the question, what is that something that is self-aware? Something that is conscious and has power and energy and a will. It looks like it's God, yeah. creator. Yeah. So if the universe wasn't always there, the equation amounts to that there is a God behind that cause. Uh, in fact, as a, as a cause is God or the creator. So either the universe is always there to remove God equation from you know, God from the equation, but here are the issues now. If the universe is always there, how does things transform within the universe? Is it by choice? You know how universe is changing. You know, matter change from one state to the other. You know how things decay, right? Any transformation to happen, does it happen because of an inherent law that is within it? It follows a law which is governing this transformation or it's just happening just, just like that. It seems to be a law that is operating within this universe. Yeah. How do you explain the existence of law? law like that. Laws and regulations are like repetitive patterns that we observe constantly, continuously. Yeah, yeah. That's why we call them law. Yeah. But they're just always there. The physical laws of the universe like the gravitational constant, the Planck's constants, all of these constants, they're very precise to so many decimal place degree decimal points in their precision. If, if, if you throw a bunch of scrap metal and plastics in a junkyard and you create an explosion, you don't expect the next generation iPhone, do you? No. Because from chaos, you don't expect this kind of order to proceed. Yeah. Yeah? So when we are talking about 
the universe that was always there and it is governing and has governed the operation and transformation of things where are these governing principles coming from inherently we need a rational explanation to, of that yeah it cannot result itself from chaos like we observe within our universe none of this explosion can create any of these phones or cameras or even this mic it's got a mic inside very precise picking up sounds yeah. and picking up sounds and transmitting it through wireless to another piece of equipment which is a receiver through explosions through kind of processes like this random chaotic events cannot produce order and precision so this could not have been how the universe has always been there and then suddenly you have laws operating and regulating within our universe it is not rational to think that way so that means whatever was there these laws were there inherently the only way you can explain that inherent laws and transformation is that thing that was there always possesses that laws yeah. and that thing by volition and choice is doing all these things yeah i guess from my point of view it's like it's just adding another complication whether or not god exists you know so say you've got the universe yeah and like the universe just came into existence with all these laws or you have god who has all these laws and it created the universe but in both situations um you're just kind of assuming that the thing just came into existence because all you're doing by saying where the universe comes from and came from God then you're just pushing that question back to so where did God come from you know I mean? the same principle applies no, you can you can ask and take that question all the way back to this God if that is what you're trying to um, question you see our universe if it has a cause let's say the cause is A A from the alpha, English alphabet you are rightfully in your rightful stance to ask what caused A? Let's say it's B. Then we can go on like this. What caused B? C caused B. What caused C? D caused C. You can go on ad infinitum, yeah. all the way, with no ending of causes. But we know that this, if that was the case, our universe will never be in its existence in this form. It's like, imagine you're in the queue borrowing a book from a library yeah. yeah the librarian wants to give you a book to, on your hand but there are infinite number of people in front of you would that action of transfer of the book from the librarian to ever happen if there are infinite number of people in in, in the queue Not God, it will never happen yeah. if our universe had an infinite number of cores prior to its coming to existence the universe will never begin to exist or come into existence yeah the fact that our universe exists is demonstrative that the causes are not infinite but finite. Meaning at the end, there is a cause. Prior to that, there is no cause. That cause is uncaused. So we will come to a point where that first cause, we are calling it the creator, the originator. Because that creator created us and gave us all of these things, we show our gratitude. And we say that this gratitude is what we call the one who deserves our God. God is one who deserves our worship, our gratitude. So that's what God question comes in. So that first cause, which is now identified as God, should not and could not have another cause prior to it. Has to be the initial cause of everything. The fact that the universe exists now. If the universe didn't exist, we'll have a different discussion. But the fact that the universe is in existence, there is a first cause. Prior to that, there is no other cause. And that cause is what we call God, who brought about all those transformations uh, and changes to our reality. Yeah. It's not difficult to get answer this question. Well, yeah, I understand that, if you define it that way. But um, I guess if you're a person, you just kind of... So yeah, there is something that can define, but it's kind of impossible to know anything about it, you know what I mean? You just assume the universe came from somewhere. It's not an assumption, this is something that we explain the existence of our universe. The, yeah. Either the universe came from somewhere or it didn't. We went through both of these options. So we are exhausting rationally. This is a scientific process in a way where we are looking at the data sets 
and see what fits rationally. Because this is what we have. We have our rational mind and we can use that rational mind to arrive at our con conclusions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when we use it, we are bound to arrive at the conclusion that there is a creator of our universe. How or what the nature of the creator is, as a finite crea creatures, we would not be able to know. Because if, just imagine a bacteria on our skin. Can you comprehend how I look like? Impossible. It is so small and I'm so big to the bacteria, the bacteria cannot comprehend. The, the vision of the bacteria cannot comprehend what my reality is. Our vision cannot comprehend the, our creator. He is beyond our comprehension, yeah. right? But we can at least acknowledge that there is a creator. And if the creator tells us who he is, what he is, what are his attributes and characteristics, only then we know. When the infinite tells the finite about its characteristics, only then we would know. Otherwise, the finite cannot understand the infinite. It has to be the other way process. And that is why the creator, our God, sends revelation, prophets and messengers, with guidance, telling us exactly who he is, what he is and what he isn't, and what we're supposed to do. And that's why prophets come and tell us, there you go, this is who your God is, and this is how you submit to your God, love your God, surrender to your God, and show all your reverence and gratitude to God, and you live your life because the reason he has created you is to show that gratitude. God could have just simply created nothing. The creator could have not created anything. The fact that he created us for a reason, and we need to fulfill that purpose. So it's now important for us to take that rational step to say, make sense that there's a creator, make sense that there's only one creator, not many. Because if there was more than one, it would be chaos and ruin. They'll, they'll, they'll be impossible to have more than one, rationally. So having that one creator, which is that religion or the way of life now on, on, on our disposal that we can examine to confirm that this is what I'm supposed to follow. So I, as a Muslim, I will tell you that the Quran is that final revelation from God. Prior to that, there were many, many, you know, prophets and messengers that God sent to guide the people because he's just. The God, the creator who created us has been in existence all the time. He is not some weak and deficient being. We have deficiencies because we are not the eternal being. But the necessary being that exists by necessity exist with perfection because the imperfection didn't come by any way because if you exist by yourself necessarily there will be no limitations and imperfections or deficiencies so the creator is not deficient perfection in love perfection in justice and fairness and so on so prophets and messengers were sent to guide the people the final messenger came because of the time historically that went we are supposed now to use our mind and our intellect to look at the Quran, the final revelation, look at the, the life of Prophet Muhammad as the final messenger, and then accept it through conviction and follow our life. And if we do that, we will be successful in the hereafter, in this life and the hereafter. Because the Creator created heaven and hell as a place of punishment for in, in hell and place of reward in heaven because of the way we are created with a choice and rationality, rational faculty. Some people will use it, some people will not. So God being fair and just, he has to reward the people who are good and punish the people who are bad. Okay? So that's why you have heaven and hell. Not everyone goes to hell. The arrogant, stubborn disbelievers who reject God knowingly, they will be in hell forever. But those people who do other wrong things, they might be punished in hellfire through the justice of God, but eventually they will come out if they really believed in God. So believers who have faith in God, if they have done something wrong, they will not be in hellfire forever. They will be cleansed through punishment. They will be eventually returned to paradise. And what is an eternal life compared to, say, one billion years in hell? Nothing. Eternity compared to a zillion years is nothing. So someone can be punished a day or a year or a billion years nothing compared to eternal life in heaven and hell so we don't want to be punished in eternal on hellfire we want to save ourselves from hellfire and that is what the messengers come and always warn us do not follow the footsteps of satan who is there trying to bring everyone to hellfire yeah? so you are a young man 
with you know huge potential to to do service for the whole world and you are clever and smart and you're thinking all about you know the reality and and you're questioning it there's nothing wrong with questioning but you have to have the right channels to question and right channels to accept the answers otherwise you'll become someone like a hyper skeptic for everything like maybe i don't exist maybe i'm a brain in a jar but when it comes to girlfriends and wives and chocolates and restaurants and and and, and food and 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 cinemas you exist and the yeah. cinemas exist and the the game exists but when it comes to god maybe i don't exist god doesn't exist don't become one of those who want to become yeah. hyper skeptical for their own desires but when it comes to you know everything else they're fully um, you know pragmatic in life yeah i guess but the thing is um because the hyper skeptics everyone kind of just has to make an assumption somewhere mm. like you have two people who don't know anything you know what i mean some people just assume everything i see is real some people assume in a different place there isn't really um there's no uh, there's no objective reason that some one person's assumption is better than the others you know what i mean assumptions always have deficiencies right yeah so that's why we try to minimize our assumptions and accept what is the factual basis of reality yeah yeah so when we undergo a process of thinking and rationalization of of anything we are removing all our assumptions but some assumptions we need to have as an axiomatic way because yeah, if you don't yeah. have those assumptions you can't operate you have to say for example the universe is rational otherwise you can't make a rational sense of anything that you operate with your yeah. with, with yeah, your the thing everyone has like an axiom but i just feel like there's no way at least our human brains can't comprehend yet there's no way in this like empirical world to really say one person's axiom is best than the other but what some axioms needs yeah. to be understood because not all axioms should be given you know in maths you say given that and in your parade something you have to have given yeah, but that's the but thing but like. but you question the ones which you are saying given is that meaningful to have given if it's not meaningful why do you take it axiomatically yeah you can't but i feel like the meaningful thing in and of itself is based on an axiom you know what i mean like what you can if you say like your criteria for media for being meaningful could vary from person to person yeah but think about this yeah if you and i didn't exist is there any question of asking any questions i have to now assume axiomatically i exist even though i know i exist okay but again if you didn't have that as a given then all the question who is asking like imagine oh i want to know well, who you are who who are you if you didn't exist so these given that you exist is something that is sensible something that is rational that that's not unreasonable yeah yeah so this is what we were saying we have to give those axiomatic you know assumptions that we have and call them that these are things that we operate under only things which are meaningful and and and, and reasonable otherwise you can assume everything is true like contradiction is true but what do we assume contradictions are not true yeah there might be something paradoxical but not necessarily contradictions because we we don't have some of these um the the understanding of our reality to understand those processes but we assume axiomatically that what you call the principle of non contradiction two things cannot contradict and be true at the same time like i cannot exist and not exist at the same time you, you can't have that yeah so oh, sorry what was your name again uh, will 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 think about what we said if these things make sense take the next step investigate the quran investigate the life of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and ask yourself could this quran be from god what do we expect a book from god to contain imperfect descriptions of god are perfect descriptions of god perfect descriptions it shouldn't describe reality incorrectly it shouldn't talk about things of the past incorrectly it shouldn't talk about something to happen in the future incorrectly so if you examine this book in this light and you find that the quran stands that scrutiny and comes you know exactly how you expect a book from god is then you should accept this book from god if the quran says you know what was sama was sama wa tariq by the heavens and by the knocking 
knockers, the one who watch knocks. And it Quran explains this knocking is a piercing bright star. Now today we realize well some of the pulsating pulses, pulsating stars, we can hear the sounds today. And they sounds like knock 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 knock. We couldn't even hear it just you know a few decades ago. Modern scientific technology has enabled us to listen to the sounds of those pulsating stars. The Quran is talking about it. These are knocking. How does he even know? Just give you an, uh, one example out of you know out of nowhere, just giving an example to tell you. you expect knowledge like this should be something that should open our heart and our mind to say, how could this knowledge be known from the author of this book, if this author was not the one who is the all wise, all wise creator. Because no one could have known this. Things like when the Quran describes about many other phenomena, if you know that this is no way possible to know this unless you have a submarine or unless you have an electronic microscope, unless you have a powerful telescope, then you would say, how did someone know this 1400 years ago? 1440 years ago. How does it know accurately about history? without making any mistakes like oh this pharaoh you know what hieroglyphics was all knowledge of it all lost but the quran says at that time that pharaoh was not called a pharaoh he was called, called the king and the bible calls him a pharaoh this kind of distinctions when easily if someone was copying the historical information that it was already present would have copied the same mistake but this mistake is not copied like the con concept of of the human beings as they're developed in the wombs and mothers there were so many understanding, even in the, you know, 1673, when we had the Van Leeuwenhoek microscope, it's like a magnifying glass, but they called it microscope. They said, we saw a human being in a miniature form. And only thing that human being was doing, that's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. It's called the preformation theory. The Quran says, no, the Quran's you know, from the sperm, it goes into process of creation and transformation one stage to the other. It doesn't just become bigger. It, there is not a miniature human being in the sperm. Sperm undergoes a transformation with, of course, the, the female counterpart in a process of several transformations, one after the other. How does the Quran avoid all those false theories of science, even which in 1673 they were believing in that? And we're talking about 1400 years ago. These kind of things should ask, this is a hallmark a fingerprint, a sign from the Creator. From his knowledge, this information is coming. If this Quran says, you know what, this person, because of his disbelief, he's going to be burning in hellfire. It was so easy for that person to destroy the Quran and say, I believe, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. That's what you say to become a Muslim. That I be a witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except. Allah and there is, I be a witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. That person, Abu Lahab, his nickname, is a chapter of, in the Quran. Allah says he will be burnt in hellfire because of his this arrogant disbelief. He could have simply come open to the public and say, I testify. He would have falsified the Quran. Guess what? He lived for about 10 years or more and died as a disbeliever. When he had 10 years of opportunity to disprove the Quran. So how does... So I'm just giving you examples which are falsifiable. So the Quran could have been falsified in various ways. This is one example. Examples about getting incorrect. The Quran says, if this Quran is from God, you'd find there are many discrepancies. Many discrepancies. Guess what? If someone was clever, he would have said, oh, there you go. There is another word, ikhtilafan. It says, la wajadu fi ikhtilafan kathira. This is how the Arabic goes, right? Someone could have said, ah, I found another ikhtilafan, another word, because the verse is saying, you will not find more than one ikhtilafan. The word ikhtilaf. Just imagine, hear the sound, the word called ikhtilaf. Huh? And if there was another word, they would say, 
But there you go, there's another ikhtilafan. Even as a, a, you know, literally speaking, from linguistics. It doesn't exist in the Quran. Only one time the whole wo- of the Quran, the word ikhtilafan exists. Not giving the chance to disprove it. Otherwise, the Quran could have been falsified from that point of view. So the Quran is saying, find a contradiction, a discrepancy. For 1400 years, we've been coming in this park, you know, since, you know, many, many years, and we're discussing this. You will see that no one with proper contemplation can bring a true contradiction in the Quran. Because if there was a true contradiction in the Quran, by the Quran's own admission, it cannot be from God. Falsified. Quran would be false. The Quran says, if this book, you don't believe in it, produce a chapter like unto it, or 10 chapters, or a whole book like it like unto this Quran. So it would have been easy for them, instead of fighting the Muslims and fighting Prophet Muhammad Islam, to produce a poetry or some kind of composition like the Quran, because they were very good at this. They used to hang poems in the wall of the Kaaba called Mu'allaq, Mu'allaqat, right? They were very good in poetry. The Arabs at that time, they became so happy when had two kinds of news. One is the composition of a good poetry, and the other one was the birth of a male child. When the birth of a female child came to them, the news, they all become dark and black in their faces, and they'll say, ah, it's like a whole world is falling on them. And they will take that daughter and bury her alive. That's how they considered a liability. But before Islam, Islam came to change all of that. Hmm. For what reason was she killed? Quran challenges them to stop this bad practice. So the Prophet came, he abandoned all this practice, bad practices of burying your daughters alive. So they would be happy when they were making poetry. The Quran came in a form in the Arabic language. It is not prose, it is not poetry, it is not the saying of the soothsayer, but it is in Arabic composed of the same Arabic letters. Why were they unable to meet it? Why were they unable to produce a chapter consisting of like three lines, let alone 600 pages? Quran gave them the option. Still to this day, they can't. There are books written by academics demonstrating the objective nature of the challenge. Why the Quran is impossible to imitate. Other literature, other forms of music and singing and so on, you can imitate. But the Quran you cannot imitate, objectively. It's not a subjective eloquence thing, oh, oh, because it's something beautiful and so on. It's not like that. It's something that is objectively shown because of the stylistics. The stylistic genre of the Quran is such that they cannot imitate it. Because it's a linguistic thing, I don't want to go too much explaining it. But if you go and study and you find out, they have the opportunity. They have the opportunity now. What is it? What's preventing them? from imitating it. What's preventing those hundreds of apostates from Islam who are free liberals, um, agnostics and atheists who left Islam? What's preventing them? I had discussion with so many of them and I say, look, okay, fine. here is the criteria. Go and meet someone. Go take your friends, go to your scholar, uh, you know, and produce a chapter like unto it. Why do they fail? This is an eternal challenge of the Quran. An eternal falsification, when I say eternal, this is an everlasting falsification test until the end of this world. If they cannot falsify this and imitate something like the Quran, then the Quranic claim still stands, this is a revelation from God. If you cannot meet it, if you cannot imitate it, what's preventing you? So Allah says, if you can't do it and you'll never do it, then fear the helper whose will is man and stones. That is the falsification test of the Quran which is something that people can take in seriously and say, okay, I'm going to try on some or many or all of them. And if I find that this is something that cannot be falsified, what is left? Surrendering and submitting to God through his guidance. That is what the Quran is asking. Submit and surrender willingly, submitting and surrender to God convincingly, humbly, knowingly, by your choice, not by blind faith. These days are over by blind faith. People can believe in Harry Potter as a prophet and believe in that book as a revelation from God by blind faith. Some people worship human beings, pop stars and idols and celebrities, don't they? 
But God is saying, no, don't make your desires as your God. But be humble to the one who created you and follow and submit to his laws because in that is the true success. Because success is not about graduation and getting good degrees and a good job at the end of the day. I mean, I'm working for what, last 20 years or something. Is this the purpose of my life? If I die and I didn't worship God, is this what success is? No. True success is being saved from the hellfire and entering into paradise. Man zuhziha anil nar wa udkhil al janna faqad faz. Whoever has saved themselves from being into the hellfire and has made themselves into the entry into paradise, they have truly been successful. This is what we should be doing. We shouldn't be focusing on the world and being in the matrix. Um, the matrix is quite deceptive because it's trying to, when I say matrix, the dig digital liberal world order, if you haven't heard about it, where they're trying to make you the consumer of their desires. You consume into their games, into their, you know, all these things so that you preoccupy yourself into that reality, not the true reality. The true reality is you are a creation of God and you have a purpose in life and you need to fulfill it. If you don't, then we'll be at a loss. Yeah. Yeah, to, to tell you the truth, um, I'm still not past the assumption, past buying that there has to be a creator, you know. It's not an assumption, it's, it's yeah. a conclusion that we've made. If you have a universe today, you have the creator for this universe. It's not an assumption, this is a conclusion. If you, if you know the creation here, you and I exist, then you have no choice but to accept that there is a creator of this creation, this universe, this reality. And that is a creator who has no other cause prior to that. It's not an assumption. Well, I mean, my assumption is that like, because it's impossible to know. What is impossible to know? If it was um, a natural process, of what? Just if things have just been if, happening. If the universe existed always, are you saying things come by naturally? Let me give you a scenario again. Do, 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 are you still studying or working? Uh, studying. Science? Uh, law. Law. Okay. Imagine you go into a printing press and you see a computer with all of these um, keyboards with A, B, C, and on so on, right? No programming. You have the computer. Would you then expect this keyboard automatically typing itself by itself with no agency, no willing agency, produce software to make a legal textbook that you are studying? It will never happen. Because there is no agency with will to say, I need to program it or I need to type in, in a word processor, for example. It will never happen. You go into your kitchen, you want to make nice pasta or nice food, whatever you eat. Whatever you eat. The food is there, but not cooked yet. To cook your food, you need the ingredients to come together with spices or whatever, with water, with heat. You have to make it, right? If you sat there and you expect it to happen, it will never happen. These ingredients will not come by itself yeah. and then make your beautiful curry. Delicious, right? Biryani. It will never happen. Yeah. This think... universe it will not, never transform itself to this stage. Which one? Do you want to read it? Yeah, it's talking about the expansion of the universe, for example. There's another thing. I mean, I didn't want to give you examples of examples for you to reflect on. For the origin of the Quran, the Quran says God created the, the heavens with his own hands and he's expanding it. Yeah. He's expanding it. So he's the one who's made it and he's expanding it. The Greeks used to believe the universe is not expanding, it's static. Today, 
we know for sure, according to our scientific realization of our data, that the universe is actually expanding. The Quran talks about this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are many examples. The Quran talks about this already. So, this information from the Quran, you have to rationally explain. Could it be Prophet Muhammad? He just guessed it. Could it be his people who guessed it? There is a limitation of guesswork. I can guess something to happen, and the probability of something to happen is 50 50, 1 in 2, right? 1 in 2. If there's two situations, if I want to guess both of them to be correct, it's 1 in 2 times 1 in 2 is 1 in 4. If there's three situations, it just multiplies by, by 1 in 2, right? So as you can see, like half times half time, it goes on. If you do the maths, if I want to get 20 situations right and right all the time, I have a one in a million chance to get it right and one a million chance minus one to get it wrong. The Quran gives more than 20, more than 40 instances and it gets everything right. So from this data analysis, you would know this is not guesswork because you now have one in a billion trillion chance to get it right and billion trillion chance to get it wrong but Quran gets it all right so the probability of that this was done by guesswork is out of the question we can rule it out so the Quran gets this information correctly from what source not from guesswork not from a man in a desert who didn't know how to read and write let alone talk about knocking stars where did he get it from the Quran says it's from God so you now need to struggle within yourself where can this information be? This information cannot be from the Romans and the Byzantines and the Persians, from the Arabs, from any other, from even from the, from the Indus Valley civilization, from, from Asia, from China, anywhere. No one knew about these things. The Quran gives us information, so now we are struggling to explain the source of this information. If you now you find a manual how to build the next generation of iPhone, you, don't, you won't expect this happened by chance in a factory explosion and then the, the book came out you would never believe in it you will never in your lifetime would accept this is a product of an explosion and a printer produced that book because this information is so precise right so when it comes to god do you have to answer it no no when it comes to the creator and this universe this universe couldn't be always there and it just everything just happens without a volitional agency behind there has to be a volitional agency which transforms one to the other, makes all these laws that is present in our universe. Our universe is made and constructed in such a way that if the sun and the earth were slightly different in a distance, if the earth's angle was slightly less, then the life would not exist. You'd find out about this discussed in the literature called the fine-tuning argument. Yeah? The universe is fine-tuned in such a way for our existence, our life. Yeah. Our life is like fine-tuned. Some people say, oh, like, oh, we have billions of other universes. Maybe this is one of them, a lucky, lucky guess. Well, yeah, I guess even the assumption, well, even the um, statement that it's a lucky guess doesn't really work with me because we don't know if this is a good universe or not, you know what I mean? There could be something where things work better which we can't comprehend mm. you know what i mean yeah but even like, the one we're in is just what we know right uh, the fine tuning thing kind of assumes that this is finely tuned this could actually be the chaotic one and there could but, be hmm? no no it's fine this fine tuning yeah. is what we observe right we we observe chaos and we observe order so it's not that we observe everything we, we don't arbitrarily say something is chaotic and something is order. We do observe patterns. We do observe order. When you read a nice piece of literature, these are letters ordered together. That's not chaotic. So, your position may be in a state not like this. This universe is always there and it just, there's no conscious, self-aware entity which volitionally changed into all of these things. But we can demonstrate examples of examples that without a volitional agent, you would not expect this kind of transformation to happen. So we have to rationally accept that there was a willing volitional agent. 
it's difficult for us to accept that because acceptance means there is an agent who is self-aware, like our, our awareness, who exists forever. I don't exist forever, but something that exists forever, something that's greater than I. The reason atheists struggle, which they won't tell you, but psychoanalysis will, it will reveal to you that the reason why many, many atheists would not accept God is because they cannot fathom this understanding that someone is greater than them. The ego prevents people to accept someone greater than I? No. The fact that you, when you realize there's someone greater than you is a realization of your humility and your, your, your real state. When you know you don't know, it's not being in a bad state, it's actually in a good realization. If I don't know something, then I'm actually in a better position than when I was confused. Yeah? Do you understand yeah. the point? That's my point. That's why I said from the start, that like, we just don't know. And it's kind of... But we do know, as we yeah. explained. We do well, know. That's my thing. I'm saying I just don't know. Um, as we've explained, yeah. we do know. To know more about God is when you read the Quran and the Quran tells you, God tells you in the Quran who He is. There are certain things your mind can speculate and reason to know about the infinite, but you can't know all of it. You can't comprehend and know everything by speculation. It has to be given to you, sent to you or revealed to you or mentioned to you what it is. There's no way you can know otherwise. Yeah? When the infinite tells the finite, the finite then is aware about the infinite characteristics, all about its characteristics. That is why we say that the limit of what the mind needs to do to know our creator and then once you know that this is the guidance from a creator, you submit and you accept. That's the rule. Because if you want to know everything through your mind, why do you consider your mind is able to know everything in the first place? Your mind could be a limited thing. Your brain or its function or something external to the brain, which is the mind, maybe that's its limitation. It cannot know more than that. But what it can know, it can make decisions about this reality that there is a God there is a creator who created us for a purpose and is not someone who is totally distant from us but sends revelation and guidance throughout constantly has sent the final messenger with the final guidance and for us now is to really reawaken our mind to investigate and accept by conviction that's all we have to do so when you investigate and you make sense to you you accept it that's all you don't need to be this kind of um, saying, I still don't know, because there are many things that your mind will be limited to knowing, but what your mind does know can confirm to you that there is a creator, and this creator has created you and I for a reason, and we have to fulfill that purpose. Yeah. I guess the way I see it is like this. We've got the universe. Yeah. And if God created the universe, then he exists outside of it. Yeah. And our human senses and human like capabilities like you know like empirical anything that's empirical that can be measured yeah that's what science is science is our tools for measuring what's inside the universe yeah but anything that exists outside science cannot science can't that's why like science it can explain like why volcanoes do what they do Correct. because they exist inside yeah. but there's no scientific experiment that you can do to prove or disprove God exactly that exists outside the universe absolutely so God's excuse me God's existence is not within the parameters of science science yeah. cannot answer that question so that's, that's why, why that's yeah, why like people who are religious who try to prove the science are just because it's just like they don't even know what they're talking about yeah. so it's not a scientific question yeah and so that's so that's why we why use like, reason and intellectual inquiry yeah to arrive at the conclusion so science is one tool to understand our natural world but we have to use other tools the tools of reason the faculty of intellect yeah. reason and using reason we do know for sure that there is a creator there's no way around it yeah. I guess maybe just actually not because I'm just assuming no, I'm not assuming no, I keep saying that it's not yeah. I mean something else when I say that just that um, all human being like capable of thinking is limited to what's inside the universe so 
whether or not there's something outside that created us, or maybe there's more, or maybe there's like seven degrees of creation, is um, we aren't able to figure that out. So I accept that I exist inside the universe, mm -hmm. and so anything. Like what you said, like I don't actually know if my parents are my parents or not. But that's possible to figure out because that's a problem inside the universe. But um That's one of the reasons yeah. God because sends God lives outside yeah, yeah. to help you will to 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 cut the chase. Yeah. One of the reasons God sends in the universe his guidance, his proof with a messenger within this universe so that we can't say oh there is no God outside because once you have the agency of God a, a human messenger human prophet verified then you know that he's been sent by the one outside because you need something from inside to make your conclusions yeah. so when God sends a messenger inside this universe gives his message inside the universe you can then connect to outside of yes now I'm sure yeah. That's the only way you have a connection. Otherwise, you can't connect to what's outside. And that's why God doesn't simply leave us in our confusion. He raises prophets and messengers from within this universe. Yeah. I just think, because first of all, there are many options. And there are many different people saying, because you've got two questions, right? There's, is there a God or not? Yeah. And then once you decide there is, you've then got several different religions to then go through one by one so it's an easy process as well yeah. there are people who believe in God and people who believe in one God people who believe in multiple gods the one who believes in multiple gods obviously gone astray because there can only be one God so you can start with trying to verify the message from this one God where it exists by looking at monotheistic religions they're not many right you examine each one and then you come to the conclusion. So you can examine Judaism, you can examine Christianity, and you can examine Islam. Many others came after Islam, which are imitations of Islam, or a bit of mixture here and there. Some religion are composition of writers of Hindus and Muslims and others, like Sikhism, for example. They are Muslim writers of their book. Okay? So you know, okay, these can be safely laid aside because these are man-made compositions of together, to make a some kind of harmonistic way of life right if you consider judaism christianity and islam you analyze each one and you will automatically see with clear conviction where the truth is islam says god sent prophets and messengers to children of israel moses was a messenger prophet so was jesus sent to the children of israel by israel okay but what happened was people forgot some part of the message and introduce falsehood within the message and that's why you see the corrupted nature of these religions at present so islam explains the existence of other religions why they are so either you have a pristine message of god intact in his purity still in present or it's not and the quran says no what has happened is mankind has corrupted the messages of god and what remains are remnants of the original message with truth and falsehood mixed together. That's why there are truths in the message within the Judeo-Christian religion, and there are also falsehoods that are introduced within it. So if you examine in this light, I can give you an example. I mean, that will sound unfair if there is no one to defend the Christian uh, Judaic religion, but this is what I do most of the time with the Christians and the Jews, demonstrate to them why there are corruption within their books, within the scripture. So when you examine the Quran, on the other hand, if you don't find any errors and mistakes and it makes sense to you and it proves to you it's from God because the information it gives, the prophecies it, it talks about, the historical information that it provides with you know, you know, utmost accuracy, then it gives you that basis of belief, which is now I am intellectually convinced that this is the work of or product of or the guidance from the creator. It cannot be the product of a human being from that time or any other time. Or it cannot be the product of anyone else other than God. So this is how you can be convinced of it because you can't falsify it. There's two ways of doing it. Convincing without doing any falsification test or falsif trying to falsify it and you can't falsify it. Then you, you are submitting to it that yes, it has to be. Think about it. Reflect. 
and do your more research, more thinking, more questioning, and convince finally where the truth is. Truth, look, the true reality, the truth is not somewhere like it's so obscure. It will stand out. You just need to have that spirit in your heart for the love for the truth and you will see it. Some people see it, but because of something they have in their heart, because, oh, what if now I accept, then I have all these responsibilities. Or what if I accept this truth, then I have to, I lose my job, I lose my business, I lose my girlfriend. The consequential things stop people accepting the truth. We have to have these feelings in our heart, this approach in our heart, that if the truth is wherever it is, I will accept it. The love for the truth. And this is what Islam wants, that you want to submit submission to Allah. There are about seven conditions. You will you learn about it when, you, when you're going to submit. One is one of sincerity, that I am going to sincerely say there is no God worthy of worship except Allah. With all sincerity, with all love, and with knowledge, and so on. Right? Conditions. So that I don't just simply blindly believe in things, but I knowingly, humbly, willingly, convincingly accept what it is. So these are the things that is for you to, 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 to take your journey. Okay? Because I think you already have someone Muslim in your family. What you need to do is get some assistance and help. If you have any questions, I'm your, in your assistance with all my little ability that I have and little knowledge that I have. And I have our friends and you know, colleagues and scholars all around who can help you and assist you in your journey. But what's required first and foremost is your, your willingness to participate in this journey, your persistence to know the truth and your position to accept that truth. Because if you do that, if you have that approach, God guides those who are sincere. God guides those who seek Him. One thing I will tell you, there is a hadith of Prophet Islam, a hadith Qudsi, in which Prophet Islam said, God said that if a servant approaches me one step, I approach to him ten steps. If he comes to me walking, I come to him, go to him running. So for you to understand that if you want to know God and accept who and you know, you know, surrender to him eventually, if you take one step, he will take ten steps to you, meaning he'll make it easier for you. And Allah says in the Quran, whoever Allah wants to guide, he opens their heart, their chest. It becomes so easy. Yeah? And whoever Allah wants to misguide because they want to be guided, it makes the heart constricted. So if you are really one who's seeking the truth and, op and, and willingness to be guided, Allah will open up the guidance to you and it will be easier for you. But you need to have certain things to do. I mean, there are conditions. You need to start abandoning things which God doesn't like. Don't do things which God doesn't like, like don't lie, don't commit oppression, don't commit un injustice, um, don't cheat, and so on. Be one who avoids all of these vices and upholds the true virtues of honesty, being upright, being kind, being truthful, being merciful, being just, being fair, then you will realize it's easy because the heart to accept guidance, it needs to be a, a receptacle which is ready to receive guidance. To give you a scenario that I used to give um, with my friends, always an example, if somebody wants to drink because they're thirsty and they give you a glass upside down. Can you give water? It'll be so difficult. But the moment you give water, the water is going to go down. You have to turn it around in the right way. We have to have our heart in the right way to receive guidance, which is what? To go away from all of these things, pride and arrogance and being stubborn and make it receptive to the divine guidance. And if you do that and you're ready for it, you're sincere, it will be so easy to receive that guidance. And Allah promised that He will guide those who are in this position. So it is not a difficult task, but it is a task that needs right approach. It is a task that needs one's sincerity, very importantly. Yeah? So if you're sincere and you're willing, Alhamdulillah, I will meet you again as a Muslim, not too far away, not too long away, right? Ask questions um, and get your answers. Thank you. Yeah, you take care. Alhamdulillah. Take care, my friend. Well, okay. All the best.